I will call this uh, public hearing to order. Please stand for the pledge. Melissa, would you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call, please. Carter? Here. Walter? Here. Powell? Here. Barstow? Here. Hayes? Here. Hicken? Here. Lee? Here. Okay, we have a quorum presence. Uh, the uh, purpose of this public hearing tonight is for the uh, rezoning application to be considered for uh, rezoning a property located on Refugee Road, Southwest, parcel number 063-141384-00.000, totaling 106.33 plus acres in the city of Tascala from medium low density residential, R87, zoning classification to the plan development district, PDD, zoning classification. So here's how we'll do this tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Scott. He'll make his presentation. He'll work with the applicant. You can make your presentation or ask questions. And then we're going to turn it over to public comments. I think we'll, we only have a half hour tonight. Um, please keep in mind that we have, uh, once this goes to the readings to uh, council, there'll be three readings. So there'll be more meetings if you don't get your voice heard tonight. If you hear uh, one of your neighbors uh, repeating the same thing you were going to say, then you know that point's going to get across. But we do want to make sure that we hear from everybody, and you will have plenty of time at the other meetings if we don't make it tonight. So we have a half hour to go. It's all yours, Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as you mentioned, the property is located on Ref <coughs> Refugee Road, so I have an area map for reference. The property is located here. Um, we have Mink to the east, Summit to the west, and Refugee Road to the south of the property. Uh, Refugee Road is the dividing line between Etna Township and the city of Patasula. So here is the preliminary plan here, and here is an illustrative map. On the left side is sub-area A. This is the single-family homes, and the right side is sub-area B. Those are the lifestyle homes, which are age-targeted product. Um, as you see, there's two entrances located here and here onto Refugee Road. So some general uh, statistics, there's a total of 223 lots proposed. For the R20 zoning, a maximum of 231 would be permitted. The gross density is 2.1 units per acre. And for the R20 zoning, a 2.178 max would be permitted. Uh, open space of 36.94, the planned development district regulations require a minimum of 35%. As I mentioned, there's the two access points off Re Refugee Road, and the current comprehensive plan recommends R20, uh, so the proposed density would be in line with the recommendation of the comprehensive plan. Some general statistics of the different sub-areas, 79 single-family homes, 144 of the lifestyle, Lot width 60 for the single family homes, lifestyle minimum lot width 52 feet. Both have the same lot depths, setback front 25, side is 5, minimum rear is 25. The maximum height uh, is 35 for the single family homes, 24 for the lifestyle ranch homes. Both have the minimum dwelling size of 1,300 square feet, and both <coughs> have, would have two car garages and two parking spaces available in the driveway. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval uh, with these eight conditions. We'll have this here for reference um, if need be. And I do want to mention that in my staff report it has the criteria for the preliminary plan approval, but I've also provided a copy on your dais, your dais for reference. And then at this point I'll turn it over to the applicant, and then following that I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Honey Klima, I represent the um, owner and developer of the property. I'm actually happy to be here tonight and talk about this because it's come through so, so many different changes that I think have been improvements to it, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, as you see on this drawing, and Scott, if you want to put up the color drawing again, 
I want to start off by saying that its location on Refugee Road is adjacent to the Broad Main Heights development, which was built in, I think, platted in 1959, which would be over here. That development has the same density as what we're proposing. We're not proposing a higher density. It has an R20 density. Most of those lots there are about 0.46 acres, but they have no green space, no open spaces preserved just for that development. All of that development next door is simply lots and houses, no green space. So when, when we start talking about apples to apples comparison, when we're talking about density here being the same and somebody says, oh, it looks like you have a lot of smaller lots, so you must have more, we don't. We have smaller lots and about 40 acres of green space. If we took this site and basically divided it up into just streets and lots, the lots would be bigger, but you would be getting rid of all the green space here to the west, all the green space here, and also a lot of it up here. Several of the things that the Planning Commission thought would make this a very attractive development was so, somewhat like a New Albany development, to be able to come down refugee to keep the rural effect, to have more of a front buffer and not just lots coming out to the right-of-way and street. They also asked for a street right-of-way for future um, improvements, which they gave. And in addition to that, they gave 40, 45 more feet to keep this buffer or green space up here. In addition, they have this area here at the entry. So when you pull in, you see mostly this green space, this green space and pond and this, and then you see these two lots and you come into to these particular areas. Now, I met with uh, the schools. Um, I met with Dr. Mag Wagner about three times. Um, when we first went in <clears throat> with this property, there were 293 lots instead of 223. We had 151 single families and 142 houses for the empty nester type um, de uh, design. We call them empty nester, or we call them lifestyle actually, they call them. I've been calling them empty nesters so I could define them more. But they're more for people, and why are people that are older or people without kids more likely to buy them? Because this, first of all, the empty nester product will be over here, consolidated over here. The empty nester uh, development basically are all single family houses, all ranch style, so there's not stairways, but they also have a master association which takes care of the lawns which does not allow you to have play material out there. You can't have swing sets. You can't entertain your kids in the backyard. You can't have fences. Snow removal is taken care of by the Master Association and your driveways, all that type of thing. So this, this type of a product, and they're good at doing it, they have designed a, a single family houses, people buy, but then they don't have to take care, they have to pay an association. And really what their comps show or what their statistics show is 90% or so of those houses do actually end up being sold to people with no kids. It is a popular thing and it's becoming great in communities, especially aging communities where people want to stay in their community and, and sell their larger homes where they raise their ch children and stay in Patasqua. So when I first went to see Dr. Wagner, he said, Connie, why don't you have more empty nester houses and fewer single family because we like, we'd like less kids at this point with our schools. So the next time we went through, we, had, um, we went down to 99 single families, 171 empty nesters, and the planning commission said, we don't like that, that's a little too much. So we came back again and we are here today with the support of the <coughs> planning commission with only 79 single family houses over here, 79. And the rest of the property, or the rest of the units, which are actually 144 empty nesters, are on the east side. Now, one thing when I was talking to different people about the development, uh, a lot of misconceptions. Okay, you have two, uh, your lots are too small. Uh, you can't fit a big house. Well, that's not true. We actually have lots that are 52 uh, by 130, 160, I'm sorry, 60 by 130, and they accommodate houses such as this. The minimum square footage that they're proposing for this area for the single families are starting at 1,800 and going up to 2,718, 27, 2,718 square feet. That's, those aren't small houses. Your code in this area, R20, permits a 1,300 square foot house. And they have their single family starting in the 1,800 range and going up. In the empty nester area, their range is going from the 1,300 up to 1,720 square feet. These houses are not small, they're nice sized homes, and they're comparable to the homes that are actually over at Broad Main. 
Over in Broad, Maine, I went through the auditors, and I see that they have houses up to 2,800, 22, and they have houses that are 1,100 square feet of usable space. They have houses that are 1,200 square feet of usable space. So they have a great mix of housing over there, and we're not, we're not under any of the square footages that are next door. They are actually some smaller than what we're proposing. Um, also, price range. Um, a developer that comes in and has put so much time into something like this knows what the product they want to sell, knows what the market is, at least relatively so, unless there's a, a something that happens in the next few years. And they have to know that, otherwise they can't, they can't basically do their budget and take care of what they need to do on site, which is a, a lot of work. Um, the houses, the single family houses, will be in the range of around 300 to 345,000. And the empty nester homes will be in the range of 265 up into the low 300s. So these are not small houses, they are not cheap houses, and they are on a development that has the density similar to and comparable to the next door neighbor's <coughs> development, and also the R20, they're, they're above what, um, are, they're below what the R20 would permit. I have a lot more information um, that I could go over, um, uh, several, but I won't because I know we're short of time and everybody wants to be heard. But I wanted to point out here that the green space that we have, um, I think that there was some under misunderstanding. At one point, our cul-de-sacs were uh, uh, basically designed under our city code, but not the fire department's code. They have now been upgraded to make sure they not only satisfy our code, but they satisfy the dimensions or the diameter that the uh, fire department requires, which is larger. I also want to point out that this eyebrow type thing here was put here so that the, actually if you're in the development, you're on your bike or whatever, and you want to come over and you want to go on a trail or whatever, you can park your bike here, you can do that type of thing. This is usable green space. We have some wetlands areas and all that, but this, as you see, is a, is a beautiful area. In fact, I flew back from uh, Washington, D.C. this afternoon. We actually flew right over the site. I thought, this is unbelievable. I could look down and see this is a beautiful site, and I think that they've taken great advantage of that. This was one of the things that was changed uh, in the Planning Commission because originally the green space was not consolidated. It was spread throughout because under the code you're supposed to have so much of the units actually touching the green space. But when you do that, you come up with slivers of stuff that's hardly usable. So with the Planning Commission's discussions, we decided to consolidate more of it into areas that actually could be used. And also to buffer from uh, the development to the, to the west, as you see, there's, there's a lot of trees here. Um, no, no lots are actually touching or, um, or basically over here. You will not be adjacent to any lots. This will be a pond and this will be all the green space. And in the future, the same on the east side. Does anybody have any questions? Your green space though, has no, unless it's a tree line that's bordering the property, there's no, there's no trees there now, it's just open space, right? I mean, <coughs> the, the picture looks as though it's depicting that there's there's trees. That's that's being currently farmed, correct? There are trees there. Yeah, no, there are there are trees there, and yeah. and we will be in the the area adjacent to the park where the path goes through. We will be planting trees there. Questions? I, I do have questions, but we're limited on time, so I wanted to make sure we had, is that something we can email? I want to make sure the public sure. gets time to ask their questions. Go ahead. Ask a quick question, Tom. So, so quickly, um, traffic study. Um, I know you guys said you had a traffic study done. Was that done during school yeah. hours? It was? You can answer the traffic study. Uh, it was, yeah. Hi. Uh, Ryan Reed, BBC Management, 3601 uh, Richard Road, Miami, um, Ohio. So the traffic study was done um, during the summer months at the peak hours of commuting time. So it wasn't, it was done in June. So I don't believe it was done during school hours. Um, we can double check that. Um, but it was during um, the peak, I think seven to nine and four to six um, okay. times. Um, I just, with that school being right around the corner, I just mm -hmm. wondered how that impacted the study. And if it, yeah, if that's something you could get the answer for. So <coughs> sure, sure, we definitely can answer that. And, and we actually talked about that extensively at Planning Commission. 
um, that counts there. Um, if we were to even increase it, um, if memory serves me, it would have to be, the trip count would have to be actually increased a couple hundred percent to even warrant um, one of the improvements um, in there. Um, so the, the traffic that we've analyzed and then accounted for per ODOT standards shows that it's well within, uh, within uh, the limits um, that are described. Okay, one, one last question um, for either of you. Um, the lifestyle homes, I know those are targeted for what, what you described as a thrifty nester. Is, you know, when we're talking about burden on the school, is there anything that is there anything that requires for that to be? I mean, if, if those don't sell, I'm sure that you're going to want to sell that to the empty nester, what you're targeting. Is there anything that, I, I mean, I would assume that then you would go out and try and target the anyone else that would buy it. So if, if that didn't go the way you planned, mm -hmm. I would assume that that's the, the path you would take. Because there's nothing that requires it. Yeah, so, so um, correct. So it is an age targeted, and as Connie mentioned, um, Ryan Holmes, who will be the builder, and there will be targeting that age, and they have a 90% retention, um, not only in Ohio, but nationally when they do target it. But we, uh, they will not be restricting it to an age limit. Um, me, myself, I have uh, lots of friends who have chosen not to have children um, that will love a low maintenance house. So we don't want to exclude that, that buyer. Okay, thanks. And just for clarification, Scott, um, what re refresh my memory, what, what's it currently zoned and what's the, the, um, the, the most lots that they could have with that? It's currently zoned R87, which is a two acre minimum. So it's about 106 acres. If you take out right away, you're looking probably about 50, 51, 52 along in there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Do you, do you want us to ask questions now or do you let the public go ahead and make their public comment? Well, because we're going to be limited here very uh, quickly. If I can say, why don't we go ahead and let the public speak? I mean, we have three readings on this. Yeah, that's, that's, what that's what I was I just I anticipate okay. that. Okay. The Listen, hang on, hang on just a second. Okay. We only have one person that has put their name down and wishes to speak. So that's why I grabbed the clipboard to see how many people wanted to speak. We can, and I talked to Mr. Zetz, we can let the public speak and then go back to our questions or again. As I said before, we can continue this at the next two readings, or however long it takes. So we'll open it up to public comment. I have one person, Dan Bauer, who wishes to speak. Sir. <coughs> Name and address for the record, please, sir. Dan Bauer, 287 Summit Green Road. Okay, yes. Five minutes to speak, sir. Five minutes. <coughs> The lady that's uh, presented this made the comment that the development next door was plotted in 1959, which is correct. But I want to first of all mention there were an awful lot of mistakes made when they de uh, developed that. Our lots are about a half an acre, and apparently those in charge at that time had no idea that we were all going to have to have water and restrooms. I bought my home seven years after the original development, and we almost immediately had well problems and sewage problems. We were saved by the bell when the Southwest Licking Water and Sewer District came in. My reason for appearing here tonight, I would hate to see the same thing happen with this development that happened with us. Only, I'm here tonight, I know you've got water and sewer up there. I'm here tonight asking you people not to approve this because of what it will do to the Licking Heights school system. I retired from there, Licking, I retired from Licking Heights 18 years ago, so I know I have a vested interest, somewhat. But, at that time we had 1,200 students. Two years after I retired, they built a new high school. Well, I'm assuming most of you are aware, now 18 years later, we're building another new high school. And I am also assuming, or at least I know there's one educator up there that knows it's not easy to pass school levels. This development, and I was not able to find a statistic for um, how many children come out of a home in this day and age in Central Ohio. 
but in the nation, there are 1.9 children per household. So that translates into the fact that this uh, project could put 433 more students in the Licking Heights School District. The district had, in addition to building that high school 18 years ago, have built several elementaries and renovated an elementary and renovated um, a school to become a middle school. So needless to say, they're not hardly able to keep up with what we have now. Also, I want to make mention of the fact, and believe me, these empty nester homes sound very good to me. However, there is one on Summit Road, just south of Broad Street, before you get to Summit Baptist Church. If I'm correct, the name of it is Falling Leaf. I have seen school buses in that area. I'm glad that Mr. Lee questioned that because I don't think anyone that's got a house to sell is exactly going to be thrilled about putting it on the market if he can't sell it to whoever wants to buy it. One minute, sir. So, uh, being a public school educator, I hope that you will put the interest of the children First and most, when you're making your vote, I definitely feel the density of this housing development is too much for our school system to assume. And I know my lot's the same size. But back then, there was no problem in having a classroom short of a modular that could be used for education. Thank you for your time. Anybody else wish to speak that did not sign in? Mr. Wagner? Would it be okay to share some paperwork? Mm -hmm. I want to comment on the uh, Philip Wagner Road, 6539 Summit Road Southwest. I uh, want to talk about district enrollment to the previous um, review by Mr. Bauer was appropriate. Um, <coughs> what you see in front of you is our district's um, enrollment moving forward, and I want to talk about that a bit. Um, as we are looking at housing developments, and this is one of the larger discussion as we look at developments, um, we looked, and within uh, the school district boundaries, we have 881 school, or I'm sorry, 881 potential houses coming into the school district in the very near future. Um, this would be, this project would be one of them. I want to talk a little bit about enrollment, and you can see from the projections. What you're looking at is 2019, and it shows on there 4572. And what these enrollment projections show is all of June of uh, each year, and it takes us through 10 years. Um, right now, um, we're already just beyond where we should be in June, and our projections, we're close to 4,600 students. Conservatively, if you go up through the ranks there in the next 10 years will be over 6,000 students in the school district. My concern today is more about infrastructure and how we're planning for the future. I think there needs to be discussion about how the schools are going to manage the growth. And um, you know, I, I also have interest in uh, first responder city services as well as others as well too and how we're going to manage this with this development and others. Appreciate the work with the conference of planning that involved somewhat with that. I like what I'm seeing there. But you know, as a previous presenter um, discussed, we have a new high school that comes online in 2020. Uh, that building was built for 1,500 students with a core to 1,800, we can expand it. When we open that building, we're projecting 1,350 students. And that's based on current enrollment trends we have. If we keep adding all these housing developments, this is going to escalate. Um, I think from the uh, conference of planning that we've seen, uh, there's another seven to 8,000 to 8, developable acres within um, the task on not all of which are in our school district, but a great majority are. And uh, you know, just have great concerns about how much density we're going to put into the community. Questions I can answer? I've given you the handout, and this is all. We only have these story works, by the way, because we've been making these presentations. We didn't do this for tonight specifically. We're just like, okay. Anything I can answer on behalf of the school district? Uh, I think that 
the presentation you just gave right there speaks for itself. The, how does that fit in vis-a-vis -vis the specific? Do you, do you differ with what's been presented? Do you, are you comfortable with it? And, and just out of curiosity, I, and, and I, you know. <coughs> These projections that we have were all based on work we had with the state of Ohio prior to, we were in a co-funded project with the state, so this was all done prior to a lot of this development. So these numbers would escalate. So no, I have concerns about the project because I have concerns about this project as well as others. How is this going to fit into the, into the overall uh, planning for this community and specifically the schools in this case? Um, so I, um, as you're looking at this enrollment trend, we see another elementary school coming online in 2024 or 2025. The challenges I have is we have a relatively high tax base. How much more can we put on the, the families to carry some of this weight. We have over $100 million in uh, debt that we're carrying for buildings right now. And unless we can retire some of that debt, you know, I don't know how much more we put on families. We have one of the highest tax rates, at least by schools, in Lincoln County. Mr. Barstow? Hey, Dr. Barstow, I have a question. Um, this, is, this is a change from R87 to R20. So if this was an R87 development, you heard the densities from uh, Mr. Fulton, would, would you feel more comfortable with it, with it if it was developed as, yeah. as as it's currently zoned? I think as much, yes, that's the question. I think as much as we can manage the development. I know there's a push and pull here where we need some additional people in the community, help with <coughs> economic development. I understand all that relationship, but this density is what concerns me. So yes, I'd be more comfortable with a, a smaller density or a, a lesser, you know. Um, the R87 brings in about 50, approximately 50. Right? Yeah, and to answer the question, this is not a perfect science, and you look at school districts across you know, the state will vary, but you know, Central Ohio is really where there's a lot of growth. We're seeing about, in our information, about two students per household right now. Okay. And I think the information was, a, or the question was a good one about, can we control, legally you cannot, you know, say that someone can't move in there. We have, we have a three-quarter residency officer we use to help manage multiple families living in a house. And, you know, it, things where their zoning doesn't comply with Multiple, fam multiple families in a home, and we just have a lot of concerns with that. Thank you. Okay. Anything else for Dr. Wagner so we can move on? Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have three minutes if somebody would like to speak. And, uh, and again, I'm going to remind you, we have, we're going to have three readings on this. We'll have plenty of time to, to get your input, and you're always welcome to, to call us here at the city and discuss it with the uh, Yes. Yeah, the first reading starts tonight. We have two more readings, of it, which will give you two more times to speak, times two, because we obviously have, you can speak before the meeting and at the end of the meeting, five minutes and three minutes each, so there's plenty of time to speak. Anybody else wish to speak before I turn it back to Connie? Yeah, I wanted just to point out that when it was asked Scott about what could be the result of the amount, he said approximately 50, we're proposing 79 single-family houses. Um, and the idea that you, uh, work, you can limit the age group uh, doesn't mean you could, could um, basically, you're saying we want to make sure that no one moves into this that's, not, that's under 55. It's, as Ryan said, uh, there are a lot of people that don't want to have children and would find this a conducive place to live. A nice, beautiful home, uh, green space to walk on, uh, uh, probably fees and, and such that, that they, if they had kids, they wouldn't want to live there. Um, and, and I and I still think it's and I I still battle when I sit here and I listen that we we adore and want our children to be in a community that thrives and grows, but we don't want our community to thrive and grow. We want it to stay status quo so that we can always make sure that everybody has uh, has a school, everybody has all, all the amenities, and it seems that a community should should look more at the bigger picture and say. How can we help schools keep up with the children? Because the children are the, the uh, are not the problem. The children are the goal. And and limiting them, saying we don't want more, seems strange to me. Thank you. So it's a minute till seven, yes, sir. So my question would be: during the first reading, is I was wondering if the if the owners, Rep and Connie, would stay so that they could answer questions during that time. Is that possible to do? Okay, because I've, I've got several questions. Okay, like very good. All right, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved yes, by Mr. Uh, Barstow and seconded by Mr. Powell.
Kathy, roll call. Carter? Yes. Walter? Yes. Powell? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Hayes? Yes. Picken? Yes. Lee? Yes. Hearing okay. adjourned. We have one minute. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.